Logic is all about taking some premises and trying to work out on that basis whether a conclusion would be true or false. But what about if sentences can be neither true nor false? What about if they can be both? Let's take a look. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Attic. In this video, we are going to be thinking about non-classical logics, logics that allow sentences to move beyond just truth and falsity. We're going to be thinking about sentences that might be neither true nor false. We're even going to be thinking about sentences that might be both true and false at the same time. How can we make sense of that using logics? We're going to be thinking about logics that add an extra truth value, neither true nor false, or both true and false, to help us deal with these cases. If you're finding this stuff interesting, if you're finding it useful, why not subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon to get updates. Today, we're going to be talking about many valued logics. And in particular, we're going to be talking about three valued logics. We're also going to talk a little bit about four valued logics and maybe mention a little bit about infinite valued logics, fuzzy logics. Okay, but let's have a look at three valued logics. What are they? Let's start with the basic idea of classical logic. We've got two truth values, true and false, and every sentence has to be exactly one of them. OK, every sentence is either true or false and it can't be both. So there we have a bunch of different ways in which we can go from a classical to a non-classical logic. We might allow sentences to be neither true nor false. Or, on the other hand, we might allow a sentence to be both true and false. And we might allow both options. So we might combine all of this and say a sentence can be neither true nor false or it can be both true and false. So there we would really be looking at a four-valued logic. How are we going to do this in a logic? What's going to be our underlying approach? One way of doing it is the relational approach. On this way of doing things, we stick with the two truth values, true and false, but we relate sentences to those truth values. So we might say, for instance, P is related just to false, so P is just false. Q is related to true, just to true, so P is just true. R here, it's related to both of them. So R would be both true and false. Whereas S here, it's not related to any truth value. So S would be neither true nor false. So that's a way of doing it with just two truth values. So sticking with just the two classical truth values, we might say that a sentence is just one, just the other, both or neither of those. OK, that's a perfectly good way of doing it, but it's not going to be the way that we're doing it today. This is a two-valued semantics where we let a sentence be related to one, the other, both or neither of those values. But what we're going to be interested in today is three valued logics. OK, so semantics where there are more than just the two classical truth values. So let's have a look at that three valued logic. We're going to introduce a new truth value. I'm just going to call it other for the moment. True, false and other. Reason I'm doing that is I don't want us to think of this as meaning anything particular at the moment. So it's not both true and false. It's not neither true and false. It's just another value that sentences can take. And that allows us to do some technical stuff independently of putting a philosophical interpretation on this truth value. So just for the moment, it's just going to be some other truth value and we're not going to give it any particular meaning. And then later on, we're going to think about what it should mean and how we should understand it philosophically. And basically, when we come to interpret it, we can interpret it as meaning either neither true nor false, or it might mean both true and false. What we're going to do is give an account of the connectives, not and or if then, in terms of these three truth values. OK, so we're basically back to truth tables. We're back to truth functional logic, looking at the truth values of the A's and the B's. We're going to work out the truth values of A and B, A or B, if A then B, not A. We're going to use truth matrices to do this. OK, let me show you how that goes. In the case of negation, it's pretty straightforward. 
We stick with the classical values. So if A is true, then not A is false. And if A is false, not A is true. That's just like the classical truth table. But if A takes the value other, what value is not A going to be? Philosophically, there could be some different arguments here, but we're just going to take it to be other. So when A is other, not A is other. So it's like when A is in the middle, so is not A. So negation, it's still toggling true to false and false to true, just like in classical logic. But with other, it sticks where it is. Not A, when A is other, will also be other. OK, now let's have a look at how it goes for the other connectives and or if then. The way I'm going to set these out is a little bit different than a truth table. I'm going to set them out as a truth matrix. It just gets a bit easier to write these out now that we've got these three values in play. So what we're going to do is we're going to have over on the left side here the value of A, true, other or false. And at the top, the value of B, true, other or false. And in the middle here, we're going to write the value you get when A is, say, false and B is, say, other. That would be the value that we write there. OK, so what are these values going to be? So here's the principle we're going to start with. The classical combinations, combinations of T's and F's, we're going to stick with those. So let's look at those four classical combinations. When they're both true, A and B is going to be true. A false and B true, the combination is false. When A is true and B is false, A and B is going to be false. And when they're both false, it's going to be false. But what about these new cases here? What value should we give to those? So one way to extend the classical idea of conjunction is that when one of the conjuncts is false, it doesn't matter what the other conjunct is. The whole thing is definitely going to be false. So this thing I'm writing here, it's not really a sentence of logic. It's a kind of a shorthand for saying when one of the conjuncts is false and the other one is some other value, the answer is going to be false. Actually, you can think of this as a bit of algebra. OK, this would be an algebraic operator. These would be the objects of the algebra. If you know what that means, great. If you don't, it doesn't matter. We don't really need to know it here. So applying this principle that just by one conjunct being false, the whole thing will be false. That gives us an F there and it gives us an F there. That's when B is false. Second principle, when one of the conjuncts is true, the answer then depends on what the second conjunct is. So if the second conjunct is true, the whole thing's true. If it's false, the whole thing's false. And if the conjunct is other, the whole thing will be other. That's the new case. So that gives us an answer here and here. One case remaining, this case in the middle. But the classical principle here is if A and B take the same truth value, then their conjunction should also have that truth value. So both true, true, both false, false. And the new case, both other, it should be other. So putting all that together, that gives us this truth matrix. What about disjunction? Let's do exactly the same as we did with conjunction, OK? Start off by filling out the four classical truth combinations. So both true, they're going to be true. One of them true, still going to be true. Both false, the whole thing will be false. But that leaves these five cases in the middle to be worked out. But again, let's try to expand the classical idea of disjunction to this many valued case like this. So if one disjunct is true, the whole thing's true. That gives us these cases. If one disjunct is false, the whole thing should be whatever the second disjunct is. That gives us these cases. And again, if both disjuncts take the same value, then so should the disjunction. So if they're both other, the whole thing should be other. That gives us this middle case. So that is our truth matrix for disjunction. Just before we get on to implication, if then, let's just have a think about what we've got here. So one nice thing we can do here is think about these three truth values coming in an order. First of all, false, and then other, and then true. OK, so thinking of true as the greatest value and then O kind of in the middle and then F as the least value. One thing you could do is put numbers on these and sometimes you'll see these written out with numbers. So zero is associated with false. One is associated with true and then other in the middle as a half. Often you'll see truth tables or truth matrices written out with numbers in just like this. Basically what that means is one is true, zero is false, half in the middle, other. 
then we've got this nice relationship, this nice way of kind of cashing out the value of and and or and not the conjunction is going to be the minimum value of the two conjuncts. So you look at the value of each conjunct and you say, what is the lowest one? That's the value of the conjunction. OK, so if they're both true, true. If they're both false, false. If one's false and one is true, false. If they're both other, other, etc. That captures the classical case and all of the new cases. Disjunction, on the other hand, the value of the disjunction is going to be the maximum value of the two disjuncts. So if they're both true, true. If one's true and the other's false, true. If they're both other, other. If one's false and the other one is other, the answer will be other. So that captures, again, all of the classical cases as well as all the new ones we're just adding. We don't need to add these numbers here to make sense of these. This idea of the minimum or the maximum value, it's captured by this ordering. OK, so the maximum out of those three is true. The maximum out of those two is other. The maximum out of those two, say, is true and so on. But for negation, it makes more sense when we put it in terms of the numbers. The idea of negation here is we're taking it away from one. OK, or taking it away from the maximum value. OK, so the value of not A, it's going to be one minus whatever the value of A is. So if we've got a true sentence A, its negation is going to be one minus one, zero. So that's false. If the value of A is false, our value for not A is going to be one minus zero. So one, so true. So there we've got the idea that negation toggles one to zero and zero to one true to false and false to true, but it also keeps a half where it is, OK? If you put a half in, you get a half out. So not of other is going to be other. If A is other, then not A is also going to be other. You kind of stick in the middle there with negation. This stuff here, it's a nice way of representing the same information that we did with the truth matrices. It's just a different way of thinking about it. One really nice thing that you get with this representation is that it works irrespective of how many truth values you've got. So we could keep adding more and more truth values. We could have four or five or six truth values. As long as we put them in this ordering, saying which one comes first, which one comes second, and so on, we can still make sense of A and B, A or B, and not A, in terms of this maximum, minimum, and one minus kind of formulation. We could even have infinitely many truth values. We could throw in, for instance, all the real numbers, all the numbers that you can express as decimal expansions between zero and one, treat each of those numbers as a truth value. And then you've basically got fuzzy logic. You've got uncountably many truth values. But this formulation of A and B, A or B, not A, still makes perfect sense. What we can do is think of these numbers as a sliding scale from one, totally true, to zero, totally false, with every shade in between. So there's no gaps between these numbers. There's no sudden jumps between true, a little bit less true, a little bit less true, etc., etc. It's a kind of a sliding scale with no gaps all the way from totally true right down to totally false. That's fuzzy logic. We're not going to look at that in any more detail. But basically, it's just an extension of the three valued logic that we're looking at at the moment. OK, so what about implication? What about if then? Let's do the same thing we did with and and or. Let's look at the four classical truth value combinations. So when A is false, it's going to be true. And when B is true, it's going to be true. But when A is true and B is false, it's going to be true. False. OK, so that's the four classical values. What about these intermediate cases? So I guess it's not quite so clear what the classical principles of implication are that we could leverage up to this non-classical case. So I guess two principles that are pretty clear are if you've got a false antecedent, you've got a true implication. And if you've got a true consequent, you've got a true implication. OK, so that gives us these two cases, but it doesn't help with these other cases. So here's an idea. Let's just make them all other. OK, if we haven't got a classical principle that tells us which way to go, let's just stick an O in for all of them and see what happens. If we do that, what we get is what's called 
the strong Kleene or K3 table for implication. We're basically here defining if then as not A or B, just like in the classical case, okay? So if we combine the three-valued matrix for disjunction with the way that we've treated negation, look at the combined table we would get for not A or B, it will be exactly like that. And if you think about it, this pattern we've got here with kind of three O's forming a little uh, right angle, that's what we had in the disjunction and the conjunction cases as well. In fact, what we've done here is we rotated the disjunction table 90 degrees anticlockwise, basically because we're negating the A part of it. Now, it's not at all clear that this is the right way to do things. To see that, have a look at this middle value here. This is the value that we get when A is other and B is other. According to this K3 matrix, the value of if A then B in that case should be other. But you might think to yourself, well, if A and B have got the same value, then shouldn't it be true to say if A then B? It's not like B is any less true than A. It's not like you're going from something a little bit true to something a little bit less true. Other arrow other, it looks like A and B there are exactly as true as each other. So there's an alternative way to do the matrix for the arrow. And that one goes like this. We just change the O in the middle to a T. OK, and this is the principle that whatever your truth values are for A and B, if they're the same value, if A and B say take the same value, your answer to A arrow B should be true. This is called the Wukasevitz table for implication. OK, so that's Wukasiewicz. I can't really pronounce that properly. He was a Polish logician and he was interested in these kind of cases where classical logic fails. I think he was thinking about the future. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But the idea being that if you think ahead to the future and make statements about the future, they might be neither true nor false. So you have to have these cases where a sentence is neither true nor false. How do you build up to compounds? Well, his answer was this table here for the arrow. So it's kind of like what we're saying in the strong Kleene case is where classical principles don't really give you an answer, just stick an O in there. But in the Wukasevitz table, we've got something a bit more principled going on. Let's look at it like this. When we've got an if then, if the consequent is more true than the antecedent. Let's just say it's simply true. OK, so if we've got true implying true, it's true. If we've got other implying true, it's true, etc. But if that's not the case, if the consequent is less true than the antecedent, then the value that the whole thing takes should be the difference between them. So it, it kind of depends on how less true the consequent is compared to the antecedent. So if you start off with a true antecedent and a completely false consequent, as in T arrow F, that's as bad as it could be. You're going from something completely true to something completely false. That should be completely false. But if, on the other hand, you're going from true to other, well, you've only dropped a little bit in truth. So the output should be other. And similarly, if you're going from other as the antecedent to false as the consequent, you're only dropping a little bit of truth. So again, your answer should be other. OK, so we can express that like this. If the value of the consequent is at least as true as the value of the antecedent, then the if then gets a value of true. But in the other case, we look at the difference between them. OK, we're doing difference here in terms of subtraction. So again, this makes most sense if we're talking about the truth values being numbers, one, half or zero. But we could perfectly well define this subtraction operator on our regular truth values, T, O and F. So if we look at how that definition applies to the three cases we weren't too sure about, if we've got T arrow F, that's going to be straightforward false. If we've got T arrow O, that's going to be O. And if we've got O arrow F, again, that's going to be O. So that definition ties in nicely with the Wukasevitz matrix, but it doesn't agree with the uh, strong Kleene matrix. So in the strong Kleene case, the middle value, that's one where B is the same as A, and yet we get an O rather than the T that we get here. OK, guys, so there we have some of the ways of making sense of the connectives and or not if then, even when we have this third truth value knocking around. 
So in the next video, we're going to come back and we're going to see how we can build logics using these truth matrices. We're going to be building a bunch of different logics and we're going to be thinking about what this third truth value might mean. Is it going to mean neither true nor false or is it even going to mean both true and false. So I hope you join me back for that. In the meantime, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell icon, leave me a comment below. It will be great to have your feedback. I will see you guys next time.